Let's start by looking at the anatomy of the nose, uh, which is uh, generally divided into two sections. We have the external anatomy and the internal anatomy. As for the external anatomy, which we shall uh, start with, the external nose is the portion of that uh, that is normally visible on the face, and it consists of a supporting framework of bones and hyaline cartilage. The external anatomy of the nose is covered by the muscle and the skin, which is normally lined by the mucus, the mucus membrane. We have several bones that form the bony framework of the external nose, including the frontal bone, nasal bone, and the maxilla vein. So this external bone, external nose, has a cartilaginous ring that is normally formed by the three major cartilages, abbreviated as SLA. So the first one, we have the septal nasal cartilage, which forms the anterior portion of the nasal septum. Then we have the lateral nasal cartilage, which forms the inferior portion, and it's inferior to the nasal bones. And then lastly, we have the ala cartilage. And this ala cartilage forms a portion of the walls of the nostrils. The external portion of the nose consists of a pliable hyaline cartilage and this makes it to be a flexible part of the nose. On the undersurface of this external nose, uh, we have two openings, which are normally referred to as the external nerves, or simply the nostrils, which are R2, right? From the external, we go now to the internal portion of the nose, and uh, we have the interior structures of the external nose that are uh, that have three major functions, where they warm, moisten, and filter incoming air as we breathe in. Also, a help in detecting olfactory stimuli. We have olfactory receptors in the nose. And then lastly, they are also helpful in modifying speech vibration as they pass through large hollow resonating chambers. Um, resonance is simply defined as the act of prolonging, amplifying, and modifying sound by vibrations. So, the internal nose is simply defined as the large cavity, and this is normally beyond the nasal vestibule in the anterior aspect of the skull. It lies inferior to the nasal bone, but above the mouth, and it's lined by muscle and mucous membrane. When you look at the front, section of it, um, the internal nose will merge with the external nose, and posteriorly, it communicates with the throat through two openings that are normally referred to as the internal nerves. We have also ducts from the paranasal sinuses, which drain mucus, and nasal lacrimal ducts, which drain tears, uh, which also open into the internal, into the internal nose. So we have the paranasal sinuses, which are cavities in certain cranial and facial bones, and they are simply abbreviated as MEPS, and M stands for the maxillary, ethmoid, and sphenoid. Uh, besides producing mucus, these paranasal sinuses normally serve as resonating chambers for sound as we speak and C in the process. We have the lateral walls of the internal nose, which are normally covered by bones such as the ethmoid, the maxillary, the lacrimal, the palatine, and the inferior nasal conchae bones, right? Beside forming part of the lateral walls, the ethmoid bones also forms the, the roof. So the palatine bones and the palatine process of the maxilla which together constitute the hard palate will also form the floor of the internal, internal nose. We have a space in, in, within the internal nose, which is normally referred to as the nasal cavity. So the anterior portion of the nasal cavity, just inside the nostril, is what we refer to as the nasal vestibule. 
Inflammation in the nasal vestibule is what we refer to as nasal vestibulitis, right? The nasal vestibule is normally surrounded by cartilage, so the superior part of the nasal cavity are surrounded by the bone. Notice the little area. This little area is the one that is prone to nose bleeding, right? The one that is commonly referred to as epistaxis. We have a vertical partition, that is the nasal septum, which divides the nasal cavity into right and left sides. The anterior portion of the nasal septum consists primarily of the hyaline cartilage, and the remainder is formed by the vomma the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid, maxillary, and palatine bone. So when air enters the nostrils, it passes through the vestibule. The vestibule is lined by skin containing coarse hairs that normally filter out large dust particles. So we have three shelves formed by the projection. That is the superior, middle, and inferior nasal concha that do extend out of each lateral wall of the nasal cavity. The concha, almost reaching the nasal septum, will subdivide each uh, side of the nasal cavity into a series of groove-like passages. That is the superior, inferior, and the middle meatus. Mucous membranes uh, will line the cavity and its shelves. So the arrangement of the concha and the meatus normally increases the surface area in the internal nose, and this prevents dehydration by trapping water droplets during exhalation. The olfactory receptors lie in a region of the membrane lining the superior nasal concha and the adjacent septum, which is normally referred to as epithelial uh, olfactory epithelium. Inferior to this olfactory epithelium, the mucous membrane contains capillaries and pseudo-stratified uh, ciliated columnar epithelium with droplet cells, which is responsible for producing the mucus. So the mucus secreted by the globlet cells will moisten the air and trap any dust particles. Remember, as air is inhaled around the concha, we have machamiatas. It's normally warmed by the blood vessels from the capillaries. So drainage from the nasal lacrimal ducts also help moisten the air and is sometimes assisted by secretions from the paranasal sinuses. The cilia move uh, the mucus and trapped dust particles towards the pharynx, at which point uh, they now become either swallowed or spit out. Thus, they are not able to get into the respiratory, respiratory tract. So let's now focus on the pharynx, the throat, which you're saying it is a funnel shaped, right? It's about 13 centimeters long and it starts at the internal nares and extends to the level of the cricoid cartilage. The pharynx just lies um, posterior to the nasal and uh, oral cavities and it's above the larynx. It's in front of the cervical vertebrae. Its wall is composed of skeletal muscles and it's lined by mucous membrane. So you find contraction of these skeletal muscles with help in swallowing, which is commonly referred to as deglutination. So the pharynx um, is a passageway for air and food and also provides a resonating chamber for speech sounds Besides, it houses tonsils, which do participate in immunological reaction against foreign invaders. Anatomically, it's divided into three major regions. We have the nasopharynx, the oropharynx, and the hypopharynx, which is commonly referred to as the laryngeal, laryngeal pharynx. So muscles of the entire pharynx are normally arranged into two layers. We have the outer circular and the inner longitudinal. So the superior portion of the pharynx is what we have said is referred to as the nasopharynx and it lies uh, posterior to the nasal cavity and extends to the soft palate. Remember the soft palate forms the posterior portion of the roof of the mouth and this soft palate is arc-shaped muscular partition between the nasopharynx, oropharynx and it's lined by the mucous membrane. 
there are five openings in the lateral in the lateral walls where we have the two internal nerves and then we have two openings that we lead to the eustachian tube and then we now have an opening into the oropharynx so the posterior wall contains pharyngeal tonsils which are adenoids and they do participate in the immunological immunological reactions within uh, the nasal cavity and through the internal nerves the nasopharynx receives air from the nasal cavity along with packages of the dust lane mucus so the nasopharynx is lined with pseudo stratified ciliated columna and this cilia normally helps move mucus down uh, towards the most inferior part of the pharynx. Nasopharynx also exchanges some small amount of air within the auditory tubes to equalize air between the pharynx and the middle, the middle ear. So the oropharynx is the intermediate portion of the pharynx, okay, in between. And it lies posterior to the oral cavity, just behind the oral cavity, and extends from the soft the soft palate inferiorly to the level of the hyoid bone it also has only one opening into the oasis which is the opening uh, from the mouth the oropharynx has both respiratory and digestive functions serving as a common passageway for the air food and drink which is still part of the food the oropharynx is subject to abrasion by food particles and therefore it's, uh, it has adapted uh, itself to this function by the lining uh, of the non-keratinized stratified, mu uh, stratified squamous uh, epithelium, which, is, which normally helps prevent the friction uh, caused by those food particles. We have two pairs of uh, tonsils here. We have the palatine and the lingual tonsils which are found in the oropharynx and they also play a role in mounting immunological responses within uh, the pharynx. What about the hypopharynx? That is the laryngopharynx. Uh, this is the inferior portion of the, the pharynx and it normally begins at the level of the hyoid bone. As its inferior end, it opens into the oesophagus, which is the food tube, and um, posteriorly, and the larynx, which is the voice box anteriorly. So just like the oropharynx, this laryngopharynx serves as both a respiratory and digestive pathway, and therefore it's lined by non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. So we have several conditions affecting the nasal and the throat tract. We'll start with the first one, which is rhinitis which is simply a group of disorders characterized by inflammation and irritation of the mucous membranes of the nose. It may be classified as non-allergic or allergic, which is commonly referred to as hay fever. You find 10 to 15% of the population in US, they have allergic rhinitis. They have the hay fever. They suffer from the hay fever and this underlines uh, the body of this disease. Rhinitis can be acute or chronic, all right? Okay, so you can be able to notice the difference between the normal anatomy and in a person who is having now rhinitis. So rhinitis is when a reaction occurs that causes nasal congestion, runny nose, sneezing, and itching. We have many types of rhinitis, that is caused by inflammation and these are also we also have associated symptoms affecting the eyes the ears and the throat right number um, most nasal disorders like the allergic rhinitis non-allergic rhinitis sinusitis which is also referred to as the rhinosinitis nasal polyps deviated septum nasal uh, fracture epistaxis, nasal congestion, nasal vestibulitis, and nasal tumors. So what is the pathophysiology of rhinitis? Yeah, for the sake of the non-allergic rhinitis, this is normally caused by a variety of factors, including environmental factors like changes in temperature, humidity, uh, the smell, or food. Even infection, 
the age, systemic diseases and drugs like cocaine, prescribed medication, or the presence of a foreign body. We also have the drug-induced rhinitis, which is normally associated with the use of antihypertensive agents or oral contraceptives and the chronic use of these nasal decongestants, which normally is characterized by viral infection of the nasal mucosa, which leads to acute generalized hyperemia of the nasal mucosa, engorgement of the secretory gland and the globulet cells, and profuse secretion involving, uh, involving the sinus, right? Remember, rhinitis also may be a manifestation of an allergy. In terms of clinical manifestation, we have rhinorrhea, where we have excessive nasal drainage, runny nose, nasal congestion. We also have the nasal discharge. We could have a purulent uh, when we have bacterial rhinitis. Besides, we also have nasal itchiness and also sneezing. Headache is normally present, especially when the patient is also suffering from sinusitis. In terms of management, the management of rhinitis normally depends on the cause, which may be classified, uh, which may be identified in the history and the physical examination. So the examiner asks the patients about recent symptoms as well as possible exposure to allergens at home, environment, or even at workplace. If it is viral rhinitis, remember the cause, then the medication will be given just to relieve the symptoms. But if it's allergic rhinitis, tests can also be performed to identify the possible allergens. So depending on the severity of the allergy, we could do the sensitization uh, immunization and also corticosteroids could also be required. If symptoms suggest bacterial infection, then antimicrobial agents can be used. Remember, we can, ident we can approach the link on antibiotics to learn about the different types of antimicrobial agents. So for the pharmacological therapy of rhinitis, uh, when especially we are talking about the allergic and non-allergic rhinitis, it is majorly uh, focusing on the symptom relief. So we can use antihistamines, which will be administered uh, for sneezing, itching, and rhinorrhea. We can also have the oral decongestant agents, which can be used for nasal obstruction, and intranasal corticosteroids, which may be used when we have severe congestion. Ophthalmic agents uh, can also be used to relieve irritation, uh, itching, and redness of the eye. As for the viral rhinitis, viral rhinitis is what is commonly referred to as a, uh, the common cold. And it simply refers to an upper respiratory tract infection that is self-limited and caused by a virus. So the nasal congestions, rhinorrhea, sneezing, sore throat, and general malaise are the common symptoms that normally characterize the viral rhinitis. So specifically, the term cold normally refers to a febrile or infectious acute inflammation of the mucous membrane of the nasal cavity. So common cold refers to an acute upper respiratory tract infection. Terms such as rhinitis, pharyngitis, laryngitis helps normally distinguish the sites of the symptoms. It can also be used when the causative virus is influenza, the flu. So colds are highly contagious because the virus is normally shed for about two days before the symptoms appear and during the first part of the sim uh, symptomatic phase. It is estimated that the adults in U.S. normally averagely will have two to four colds each, each year. And the most common cause, uh, or the most common problem of this common cold, it contributes to the absenteeism in either workplace or at the school for the students. So we have six major viruses known to produce symptoms of viral rhinitis. And these ones are normally remembered using the mnemonic, really persistent calls require immediate attention, right? Real persistent calls require immediate attention, which are, uh, in which R uh, refers to rhinovirus, 
we have para-influenza virus, coronavirus, respiratory syndrome virus, influenza, and the adenovirus. So each virus may have multiple strains. For example, you have over 100 strains of rhinovirus, which accounts for almost 50% of all calls. The incidence of viral rhinitis normally followed a specific pattern during the year, depending on the causative agent. Even though viral uh, rhinitis can occur at any time in the year, in US, for example, we have three major waves account. So we have the first wave that normally happens in September, just after the school opening, uh, just after the opening of the school. And then we have the second one, which will happen in late January. And then the third one, which normally happens towards the end of April. Remember, immunity after recovery is variable and depends on many factors, including the person's natural host resistance and the specific virus that causes the call. We have manifestations of the viral rhinitis. So we have the nasal congestion, running nose, sneezing, nasal discharge, nasal itchiness, tearing at uh, watery uh, eyes, uh, scratchy, sore throat, general malaise, low-grade fever, chills, often headache, and muscle aches appear to be the most common uh, signs and symptoms. And as the disease progresses, cough usually appears. In some people, Viral rhinitis will exacerbate the herpes simplex, commonly referred to as a common, a cold source. So, the symptoms will last for about one to two weeks, and if there is significant fever or more severe systemic respiratory system, it is no longer viral rhinitis, but one of the other acute respiratory tract infection. Allergic condition can also affect the nose, mimicking the symptoms of a cold. So in terms of management, we don't have specific treatment for common cold or influenza. Remember, this is a viral infection. Management consists majorly of symptomatic therapy. So you are encouraged to provide adequate fluid uh, or encourage adequate fluid that is between 2 to 3 liters per day. Also, encourage rest, preventing chilling, uh, increasing intake of vitamin C, and using expectorants as needed. We can also encourage the use of warm salt water gargles just to soothe the sore throat, and also the use of the NSAIDs, such as aspirin, ibuprofen, to relieve the aches and fever and, 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 and pain in adults. We also have the antihistamines, which are normally used to relieve sneezing, rhinorrhea, and nasal congestion. For the medical management, we have the nasal decongestant agents which may relieve nasal congestions. However, if they are overused, they may create a rebound congestion that may be worse than the original symptoms. We also have the use of the zinc longines, which may reduce the duration of cold symptoms if taken within the first 24 hours of onset. Drug amantine, right? Drug amantine may be prescribed prophylactically to decrease the signs and symptoms as well. And we also have the antimicrobial agents, the antibiotics, which should not be used because they do not affect the virus, okay? Or they reduce the, uh, the incidence of bacteria. Uh, complication. So we are not supposed to be using the antibiotics at this case. The third conditions affecting the nasal cavity is the cold and the, the cold sores. Uh, the, the, that is the herpes simplex virus, which is a complication of the common cold, right? And it produces familiar herpes uh, labels, which is normally referred to as a cold sore or a fever fever blister, and in the past, this painful blister lip so was thought to be caused by common, uh, common cold or a fever. Even now, scientists still recognize the origin of herpes as the condition that is uh, still referred to as the common, the common sore. So we have the, we have the fourth condition like acute sinusitis. Uh, 
And uh, of course, we're talking about the sinuses, uh, the paranasal sinuses, which are mucus filled cavities with ear that will drain normally into the nose. And they are involved in high proportion of their upper respiratory tract infection. So if these openings, uh, we have, if you have, uh, this, if, if their openings into the nasal passages are clear, infection will just resolve promptly. However, if their drainage is obstructed by a deviated septum, for example, or a hypertrophied turbinate, spurs, or nasal polyps or tumors, nasal infections may also persist as a smoldering secondary infection or progress to acute separative process, causing purulent, purulent discharge. Sinusitis affects about 14% of the population and accounts for billions of dollars in direct healthcare costs. This underlines the pattern of this condition. Some individuals are prone to sinusitis because of their occupations. Just for example, if you have continuous exposure to environmental hazards, such as somebody working uh, in, in for those with pains, uh, those working with dust or dust, chemicals, this may result in chronic inflammation of the nasal passages. So acute uh, sinusitis is an infection of the paranasal sinuses, the one that we just mentioned, the MEFs, okay, maxillary, ethmoid, frontal, and sphenoid. So it frequently develops as a result of an upper respiratory infection. So this could be unresolved viral or bacterial infection or an exacerbation of allergic rhinitis. So we have nasal congestion, which is caused by inflammation, edema, and transition of fluid, leading to obstruction of the sinus cavity. This provides an excellent media for bacterial growth. And bacterial organism, bacterial organism account for more than 60% of the cases of acute uh, sinusitis. And these uh, bacteria include uh, uh, examples like Streptococcus pneumoniae. We have Haemophilus influenza and the Moraxilla catarralis. In terms of the clinical manifestations, Signs and symptoms of sinusitis include facial pain or pressure over the affected sinus, uh, nasal obstruction, fatigue, purulent nasal discharge, fever, headache, ear pain, or fullness of the uh, fullness of the ear, the oltalgia. We also have dental pain, a cough, a decreased sense of smell, sore throats. Uh, eye, eyelid edema or facial congestion or fullness. So acute sinusitis can be difficult to differentiate from an upper respiratory infection or allergic uh, rhinitis. In terms of assessment, we need to do careful history and physical examination so that you look at the head, the neck, particularly the nose, ears, teeth, sinus, sinus pharynx, chest, uh, and then we be having tenderness to palpation over the infected sinus area. Then we have the sinus are percussed using the index finger, tapping lightly to determine if the patient experiences pain. The affected area is then transilluminated. With the sinusitis, there is normally a decrease in transmission of light. We could also do sinus x-ray, which will be performed to detect sinus opacity, mucus thickening, bone destruction, and air fluid levels. For the CT scan of the sinuses, you find this one is the, only the most effective diagnostic tool. It's also used to rule out other local and systemic disorders such as tumors, fistula, and allergy. Acute sinusitis, if left untreated, could lead to severe and occasionally life-threatening conditions or complications like the meningitis, brain abscess, ischemia, infections, and osteomyelitis. We also have other complications like severe orbital cellulitis, subperiostal abscess, uh, cavernous sinus throm thr thrombosis, uh, and, and, and so on. In terms of management of acute sinusitis, remember the goals of this treatment will be to treat the infection, to shrink the nasal mucosa, 
and relieve pain. So we also have antibiotic challenge where we have witnessed inappropriate use of antibiotics for viral upper respiratory infections like overuse uh, and this overuse has resulted in antibiotics being less effective and more resistant in treating bacterial infections. This has to be avoided. So we need careful consideration to be given in the potential pathogen before antimicrobial are prescribed. This antimicrobial agent of uh, the antimicrobial agent of choice uh, for this acute sinusitis uh, for, for, for this are as follows. We have the first line like the uh, amoxicillin, amoxil, or the trimethoprene sulfamidazole, the septrin or erythromycin as our first line treatment. The second line treatment for acute sinusitis include cephalosporins like the cefiroxum, uh, the cefpodoxim, and the cefprozil, and amoxil, amoxilin clavinates, which is commonly referred to as the augmenting drug. We also have newer and more expensive antibiotics with a broader spectrum, like the microlids, uh, including azithromycin and clarithro, clarithromycin. We can also have the quinolones, like the ciprofloxacin, levofloxacin, which is normally used in severe, in patients with severe penicillin allergy, and the spaxofloxacin. Uh, which has also been used. Remember the course of treatment is usually 10 to 14 days. There is normally little difference in clinical outcomes between the first and second line antibiotics. However, costs are, are, great, are, are greater and we need to consider that, especially when you're looking at newer second line antibiotics. We also have the use of oral and topical decongestant agents, which may decrease mucosal swelling of the nasal polyps, therefore improving drainage of the sinuses. Or the heated mist and the saline irrigation may also be effective for opening blocked uh, passages. Decongestant agents, such as the pseudoephedrine, they have proven effective because of their vasoconstrictive properties. And also the topical decongestants agents, such as the oxymetazone, may be used up to 72 hours. It's vitally important to administer them with the patient's head tilted back, and this will be help to promote maximal dispersion of the medication. Drugs like the, 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 the guafensin, which is a mucolytic agent, may also be effective in reducing nasal congestion. We also have the phenylphenylene, uh, which was previously had been used in oral congestants and that pills, but a study has linked these to uh, hemorrhagic strokes in women, though also men are also at risk. Antihistamines such as the diaphragmine, uh, cetrizine, the, the fexofenadine, may also be used if allergic component is suspected. If the patient continues to have symptoms after seven to 10 days, then the sinuses need to be irrigated and hospitalization may be required. The fifth condition, the fifth nasal condition we are talking about is chronic sinusitis. Remember we just looked at acute. So chronic sinusitis is the inflammation of the sinuses that is going to persist for more than three weeks in an adult or two weeks in a child. And it is estimated to be affecting uh, around 32 million people in a year. All 32 million people develop this condition. So it normally results from narrowing or obstruction in the ostia of the frontal, maxillary, and anterior ethmoid sinuses, causing chronic uh, sinusitis and preventing adequate drainage to the nasal, to the nasal passages, right? So, this combined area is what is known as osteomital complex. So, we have blockage that persists for greater than three weeks in an adult may occur because of infection, allergy, or structural abnormalities. Remember, this will result into stagnant secretions 
and an ideal medium for uh, infection. So the organisms that cause chronic synthritis are just the same as the one for acute uh, acute uh, sinusitis, okay? Streptococcus, uh, pneumoniae, hemophilus influenza, and cateralis uh, moxalis, right? We also have the immune compromised patients uh, which who are at more risk for developing fungal infections and the most uh, uh, common uh, pathogen that that is associated with fungal infection is what is referred to as Aspergillus fumigatis. In terms of symptoms, we have impaired mucociliary clearance and ventilation, uh, cough, chronic hoarseness, a chronic headache, and periorbital area and facial pain. Uh, these symptoms are generally most pronounced on awakening in the morning. Patients could also present with fatigue, nasal uh, stuffness. In addition, some patients will experience decrease in smell and taste and also experience oltalgia. In terms of assessment and diagnosis, we need uh, to do or carry out a careful history and diagnostic assessment, including a CT scan of the sinuses or magnetic resonance imaging, especially if we are suspecting fungal sinusitis. We also have nasal endoscopy, which may be indicated just to rule out underlying diseases like tumors and sinus and sinus uh, mycetomas. The fungal, the fungus ball is usually brown or greenish black material with consistence of a peanut butter or cotton uh, cottage uh, cheese. Complications are not very common, but they could include severe orbital sinusitis, subperiostal abscess, the cavernous sinus uh, thrombosis, meningitis, encephalitis, and ischemic infarction. In terms of management of chronic sinusitis, it's almost the same as the acute sinusitis. So the antimicrobial agent of choice uh, will be the augmentin or ampicillin. Clarithromycin and third generation cephalosporins like the furoxime, uh, the, safe, the, the, the safe podoxime and the safe prozoxyl, they also are effective. We also have the levofloxacin, which is aquinolone, can also be used. And the course of treatment may be three to four weeks. Decongestant agents, uh, antihistamines, saline sprays, heated mist may also provide some symptom relief. Surgical management uh, normally happens when the standard medical therapy fails. So we could do endoscopic, um, endoscopic, which could be indicated to correct structural deformities that obstruct the openings of the sinuses. Exercise, excising and uh, cauterizing nasal polyps, correcting a deviated septum, incising and draining the sinuses, aerating the sinuses, removing tumors are some of the specific procedures that can be performed. So when sinusitis is caused by a fungal infection, surgery is normally required to excise that fungal ball and necrotic tissue and drain the sinuses. We have oral and topical uh, corticosteroids which are usually prescribed. Also, antimicrobial agents are administered before and after surgery and some patients with severe chronic sinusitis obtain relief only by moving to a dry climate. Because the patient performs, uh, usually performs care, uh, we, uh, measures for sinusitis at home, nursing management will consist mainly of patient teaching. Like the nurse will teach the patient how to promote sinus drainage by increasing the environmental humidity, uh, that is steam bath, hot shower, or facial sauna and increasing fluid intake, about two to three liters per day, and applying a local heat, that's a hot wet pants. The nurse also instructs these patients about the importance of following medication regimen, 
So instruction on the early signs of a sinus infection are provided and preventive measures are reviewed with the patients. All right, the next condition, guys, is the nasal polyps, which are simply non-cancerous, soft, painless growths on the lining of the nasal passage or the sinuses. They often result from chronic inflammation due to the asthma, recurring infections, allergies, drug sensitivity, or certain immune responses. So the patients with a nasal polyp will present with nasal congestion, running, runny nose, post-nasal drip, reduce or lost sense of smell and taste, facial pain, and even snoring. So the risk factors for this and you find could have chronic inflammation where conditions such as chronic uh, rhinosinitis, asthma, allergic rhinitis can lead to development of these nasal polyps. Also infection, frequent infection can contribute to inflammation of the polyps. Family history of nasal polyps can also increase the risk. And some individuals with a sensitivity to aspirin or other NSAIDs may develop nasal polyps. So we could do um, physical examination using a nasal endoscope where a doctor can visually inspect the nasal passages. CT scan or MRI can also help identify the size and the location of the polyps and could also do allergy tests to determine if allergies contribute to this chronic inflammation. As for the treatment, we could do nasal corticosteroids uh, where we use sprays to reduce inflammation also, oral and injectable corticosteroids, which will be used in severe cases. And histamines can also be used in the case of allergies and antibiotics if there is an, 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 a bacterial infection. We can also use biologic medication for severe and recurrent polyps. For the surgery, we have two patterns where we can do polypectomy, where we remove the polyps using small suction device or the micro debrider. We could also do endoscopic sinus surgery just to remove the polyps and correct problems with the sinuses. Remember in prevention, you have to manage allergies and asthma so that you keep the symptoms under control. You avoid irritants such as the tobacco and chemical fumes. We also try to perform good hygiene, regular, and prevent uh, infection. Humidify so that you use a humidifier at home to keep the moist, right? Remember, we have epistaxis as another condition, and then now we can look at these other conditions affecting the, the throat, right? Okay.